Right, let's set the scene. You will remember this, of course, because it's one of the, the classics, one of the great movie moments. The opening scene of 2001 A Space Odyssey. First of all, we're in space, watching the sun slowly rise above the dark rim of the Earth. Now we cut to a desert landscape where a group of ape-like creatures, I think actors in kind of gorilla suits, huddle together, asleep. One of them wakes and begins to scream. I know how they feel. In front of them, in the dirt, a giant, black, smooth, mysterious monolith has appeared. It's made of a grey black metal maybe or stone the edges perfectly sharp the surface completely flat pure geometry the witless apes look at it terrified suspicious everything they've ever seen everything there's ever been has been natural formed by natural processes but this this isn't this was designed their curiosity overcomes their fear they approach it. And later in the day, one of them gets the idea that will change history forever. Maybe I could make a tool as well. Welcome to Patented. It's a podcast about the history of inventions from History Hit. I'm Dallas Campbell. Hey, today we are going back in time, deep time, because we are, well, I suppose touching the invention that invented it all. Tools, stone tools, technology 1.0. For millions of years, stone tools were our primary piece of technology. And with their help, we have survived and thrived through ice ages. And at some point, we became dependent on them. They became a defining part of what it meant to be human. And I suppose every tool, if you look in your toolbox now, every tool's descendant is the stone tool from way back when. Well, here to tell the story of the stone tool is John Shea, an anthropologist who's been studying stone tools and their significance for four decades, as well as, and this is really important, I think, making them himself since he was a teenager. I'm a great believer in if you really want to understand something, truly understand something you've got to actually make it yourself or take it apart and really figure out what it's all about anyway if anyone can get inside the mind of our ancient stone tool making ancestors it's john and we had a fascinating chat and this is it and i hope you enjoy it I'm with John Shea, who is a archaeologist, anthropologist, archaeologist. How do you describe yourself, John? I describe myself as an anthropologist, okay. more specifically as a paleoanthropologist. But within that, I use archaeology to explain uh, human evolution. So anthropologist is good enough for me. Well, okay, well, let's stick with that. About five minutes ago, I just finished your paper that you wrote on survival archaeology. It's so beautifully written. Thank you. And I also, a few hours ago, watched, I guess it must be maybe sort of 10 or 15 years ago, you did a, almost like, a, do you know the Royal Institution Christmas Lectures? Yes. All, all we the, have in the UK? Yeah. Which I love. The reason I'm doing this is because I grew up watching those and I, and I, and I love them. And you did a, a similar one. I guess it was the, the Howard Hughes Christmas lectures or something like that. The Howard Hughes Medical Institute holiday lecture series. It's really, really good. And I'm something of a connoisseur of, of watching academics lectures. I've got to say, your one is absolutely terrific. It's Thank really, you. really good. And of course, you know, when you watch someone's great lecture or read someone's great paper, of course, it becomes your favorite topic. And now this is my favorite topic. We're talking about the stone tools. I mean, this is, like I say, this is a podcast about innovation. I don't know why we haven't done stone tools yet, but here we are. When I was watching that lecture, you mentioned when you were younger, you 
you found a stone tool walking along a path in Massachusetts and, yes. and that kind of set you on your path. I thought maybe that would be a nice place to start. It, I'd actually been on that path metaphorically and actually for quite a bit of time. I've been interested in archaeology since I was a little kid. So many different influences, I, I've lost track. But mm. I'd walked that path in the woods near my parents' home a thousand times. And I just happened to look down one day. I was, I was a college student. I was studying archaeology. I looked down at it. That's a stone tool. <laughs> I picked it up. And not only is it a stone tool, it's one of the least commonly found stone tools in the northeast of North America. So, you know, it wasn't just like a little chip or something or a fraction of an arrowhead. It was a stone tool of the sort they used to make canoes. Uh, How did it get there? Like, if it's a path, presumably the path had been, is a, was a manufactured, engineered thing. Um, the path is there from horse rides and things like this mm. and, and trails to bring firewood into the town. The woods near my parents' house is a place where Native Americans called the Agawam lived. The name Shibako is Agawam for the place of spirits. So very spiritual place. How did it make you feel? There is something amazing, and we've all done it. You'll be walking along a beach, maybe, and you'll pick up a fossil, perhaps. Or, yeah. But that idea of finding something, it does something. What, is, what does it do to us? It sort of links us to the past, doesn't it? Or links us to ideas and concepts. And I like to think that the Agawam thought it was the right time for me to find it. They knew I was, I was getting older, and I was going to go away to college and might not come back. So they said, you know, maybe they got together in the council and up in the happy hunting ground and said, now he'll appreciate it. <laughs> That's it. When the student is ready, the teacher comes. Yep. I can't remember who said that. But <laughs> it's definitely true. Things happen for the right reasons sometimes. So tell me, so, and are you sure it was an old tool? Because I know you, you do this thing, flint napping, which is you go off and you with your students and you will make stone tools um, yes. of, of this particular era just to show how they're done. And so how do you know that that one wasn't one that one of your flint nappers had not made and dropped? Since the Native Americans stopped making stone tools, only a small number of people in North America uh, do this, mm. this flint napping as a hobby. None of them in, in my town. I grew up in a town of a few thousand people. If there was somebody <laughs> who made stone tools, I'd know about it. You know? <laughs> flint napping, just define that for our listeners, because it's a term I'd never heard before. So. Well, it, it comes from from uh, your country, actually. Flint is this, this hard, uh, quartz-rich rock that occurs all over southern England. Yeah. Napping it, uh, comes from an old Anglo-Saxon uh, word, to strike forcefully, like no knocking on a door. Huh. It's nothing to do with kidnapping. Completely different word. Okay. Flint napping described what these men mostly men, did in southern England making gun flints. They'd hammer away in their cottages at these bits of flint and make these little rectangular pieces that would fit in the action of a flintlock rifle. It's a craft. Uh, it's a hobby. Um, I use the term stoneworking for more inclusively, but only a small number of people made gun flints, whereas before about 5,000 years ago, everybody on the planet made stone tools. But you don't, you don't do it to make gun flints. You're doing it to, to try and understand better how our ancestors used and made tools. I do these experiments, and flint napping is a common term we use in, in English for this modern hobby. Um, I do it to try to understand how the tools are made. I try to understand how the tools are used. A little different than most people who do this. Most people who do flint napping make the artifacts. They're basically uh, folk artist sculptors and they'll make the artifacts and they'll sell them or try to make reproductions or even go beyond what prehistoric stone workers did. That's fun. I'll do it sometimes. I sold little copies of arrowheads and things to pay for my way to graduate school, but, but uh, you know, bread and beer money. But uh, for the most part, I, I, I make the tools, I use them, I see how they work, I see how they don't work. And sometimes these can inform my hypotheses about the past. So, I mean, doing something like that, has it changed the way that you think, or, well, changed the way that you understand how tools were oh, made yeah. and, and used? I am like 90 degrees, 180 degrees, the opposite of many of my colleagues. My, my colleagues look at these stone tools and what they want to know is who made it? Hmm. They want to answer who question, who made it? And, and you know, that's fine. I don't think you can answer those questions you know, you know, conclusively because even if you find the stone tool in, in the skeleton's hand, that doesn't prove that the skeleton made the tool. I'm more interested in how questions. How do they use these stone tools to survive, to solve problems, to transmit information from one another? I mean, where, where, where should we start? Can you take us back to the sort of the earliest stone tools? Because okay. I, I, reading your work, you talk about the sort of six modes of, of oh, different yeah types of stone, but maybe you could take us back in our DeLorean, perhaps, to the to the very beginning and let us get out and look around. Where, where are we? What are we looking at? If you took your time machine to the day before the first stone tool was made, you'd still see some of your ancestors making and using tools. They wouldn't be making stone tools. That would be for tomorrow. But they'd be making and using tools out of wood. They might be using tools made out of leaves. 
They'd be using sticks and things like this, using rocks to crack open nuts. That's something both apes and humans do, so it seems reasonable our last common ancestor to... to. So this, these wouldn't be humans, though? These wouldn't be humans? Oh, these no. are sort of early hominins? These guys, early hominins, they had a brain the size of a grapefruit. If they were around, around yeah. today, they'd be in a zoo. So the first thing you'd want to do is put some, some cage or, or some <laughs> protective <laughs> barrier between you and your ancestors. <laughs> okay. They wouldn't say, hey, hey, great, 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 great grandfather. They'd say, you know, ooh, this is a strange looking monkey. Let's bite it and see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> so the next day, you'd see these ape looking ancestors banging rocks together, maybe one on the ground and one in their hands and, and uh, making a lot of noise. Like the beginning of 2001. Kind of. They're banging rocks together. They're making a lot of noise, which yeah. could have been how it originated. We bang two rocks together, the sound carries really far. If you want to signal other people, hey, I found food, clackety, 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 clack. Or what we tell people here, if you get surprised by a bear or a mountain lion, you bang things together, make noise, and it'll run away. You know? So basically, a bit like chimps. If we're looking at chimpanzees, for example, chimpanzees use, use stones to crack nuts, but that's about it. They don't, that is they, it. They're not manufacturing tools. They're not making fire or anything like that. They make little twigs that they use to perforate the uh, termite nests and, and draw out termites yes. and ants. So they can shape tools, but what chimpanzees make as tools, you can predict the shape of the tool if you know the material out of which they're making the tool. So mm -hmm. if they've got a, a, a termite fishing stick, it looks a lot like a stick. If they're cracking nuts, the uh, rocks on which they're cracking the nuts and the rock they're using to break open the nuts, they look pretty much like the rocks that they move to the nut cracking site, plus the damage occurs as a consequence of cracking nuts. When humans make tools, our designs of the tools depart from natural shapes. We've taken over the mechanical processes of the rocks and, and used our knowledge of those principles to create objects that don't occur in nature. Mm. So the day before we didn't use tools, so we, we're going to camp out and we're going to be there for the day that the first stone tool, as we define it. So first of all, where are we and when are we? We're at three and a half million years ago. Mm -hmm. We're probably in Africa somewhere. That's mm -hmm. the only place where we found tools this old, the creatures that we think our ancestors lived there. So we're probably in, in somewhere in equatorial Africa. Right now, the oldest evidence is from Kenya, but mm -hmm. you wouldn't want to be that specific. Somewhere in uh, equatorial Africa. We're camping out, okay? We're watching our, our relatives. You know, they're running around. And the, the next day, you know, resting up for the next day of rock smashing. But imagine, we get in trouble, okay? You're there with one of your friends. And your friend falls over, gets in trouble. But you... You know how to make a stone tool. So what you do is you crack two rocks together, anticipating your ancestor's invention by 24 hours, and your friend is going to cut in his leg, mm -hmm. which can go septic real fast. So you go over to mm -hmm. another kind of tree you know has medicinal bark, and you scrape off some strips of bark with that stone tool. Wrap them around your friend's leg, apply compression. You just saved his life. Next thing you got to do, because it's going to get cold. Mm -hmm. Your ancestors are up in trees or sleeping on mats on the ground. You take that stone tool, you start cutting up vegetation to put something between you and the ground mm. so you don't lose, lose body heat to conduction. Yeah. And because it's windy at night, you cut some more brush and make yourself a windbreak. You just save your, yours and your buddy's lives from dying of exposure mm -hmm. from hypothermia. Next day, the ancestors are running around with rocks, you're assembling them. You guys are thirsty. You can barely keep up with mm -hmm. the amount of water you need to take in in Equatorial Africa during the day. Mm -hmm. So you got to rehydrate. You take your stone tool, which is a big thing the size of your hand, like these early tools. You start digging holes in, in the stream bed nearby. You got water. Okay, you just save yours and your buddies' lives. Okay, you're not going to be there for three days, more than a couple days. So you don't need to worry about food. If you do get hungry, you can use that stone tool to carve yourself a digging stick and dig up some roots and tubers, break into a termite nest, or even take that stick and use to get honey out of honeycombs that the bees will put up in hollow logs. Communications. We decide to go off and, and seek rescue. Maybe the other time travelers are off watching, you know, giraffes mate or something. So <laughs> those guys, of course, that's what they'd be doing. Well, yeah, <laughs> Fun is where you find it, my friend. <laughs> so you break a bunch of those rocks and you leave them at that site where you, you and your friend were as a sign. We were here and you mm -hmm. leave them a, a hands on Gretel. You leave a trail of these things along your path to the giraffe observatory. Now, let's say your friend is hurt. Their legs hurt. You don't want to leave them behind. A lone baboon is a dead baboon, and a lone human mm -hmm. is a dead human. So what you do is you take that stone tool, you cut a bunch of branches, mm -hmm. strip some uh, vegetation, make a carrying platform. Two sticks lashed together. You put your best friend, whose life you're going to save yet again, on that 
carrying platform and you drag them to safety. What you've just described here, lots of different scenarios. You know, we think about things like bushcraft now and survival as a kind of hobby now. But back then, in the Pleistocene, it was it was slightly different. Like, how long would you and I survive in the Pleistocene? Indefinitely. <laughs> well, I've, I've got, if I'm with you, if I'm not with John Shea, how long do I survive? I'm like, crikey. I've got a few basic sandwich-making skills to fall back on. That's kind of it. <laughs> Here's the thing. My colleagues look at these stone tools, and they're asking, did this early hominin make this tool and this other one, this other tool? Or does this little chip bit of rock indicate this culture versus some other culture. And they tend to assume that these things are hardwired, that there's like a program in your brain to make this kind of tool, but not that other kind of tool. One thing we learned from flint napping is you can make pretty much anything. Here's the deal. The earliest stone tools, when I first saw these things, I thought, are you kidding me? They're huge, that's like a grapefruit. The next oldest tools, so the ones two and a half million years old, they're small, they're little, little things. You can hold like four of them in your palm of your hand. These early tools from this site in, in uh, Kenya called the Mekwi, they're big. And I thought, aliens? No. <laughs> Don't go down that route. <laughs> no. these, these early tools are big. I looked at them and I thought, yeah, but, you know, I, I thought these could just be rocks banging against each other in a gravel or something. I, I looked at them carefully, turned them around, and I looked, I could see there were markings on the bottom from where they sat on a rock and hit struck from above. Is this the sort of nut cracking? Not at this site, but at another site approximately the same age, a place called Tikika in Ethiopia, archaeologists have found bits of bone with scratch marks on their surface. It's the sort that stone tools leave when you accidentally cut into bone when, when one's butchering an animal. So we know they're cutting into animal flesh, but we don't know what other things they're doing. You can carve a spear, you can carve a bow, you can make a house. But as soon as the termites hit those things, those things are gone. All that remains is the stone tool. That suggests a lot of these stone tools only sites are giving us false negative information. I want to talk a little bit about how sort of tools develop, but I just before that, I just want to I just want to understand what happened in our deep ancestral past. When you were giving me all those different scenarios about how tools could be used, the thing that they all seem to have in common is this idea of forethought. We can think ahead. We have a theory of mind that presumably other species didn't have. And I'm just wondering, where did that come from? The idea like, oh, crikey, my buddy's broken his leg and I use the bark of that tree to fix it. Or I can chop down a tree in order to make a bridge over a ravine. That implies an imagination and a, a sense of future and past and present. We have that. And our near primate relatives have it too. Chimpanzees and bonobos, gorillas, orangutans, they aren't stupid. But I guess what I mean is there seems to be a jump between bonobos, crows, and human beings. Like we're the only species that have figured out fire and iPhones. Well, humans and our immediate ancestors are the only ones who figured it out. Only us and the Neanderthals apparently devised technology for creating it at will. We depend more on the technology than earlier hominins or other primates do. If you take away a chimpanzee's nutcracking stones, mm -hmm. it won't be happy, mm -hmm. but it'll survive. If you drop you or me into the kinds of environments in which our ancestors evolved, so somewhere in Eastern Africa, we'd be in trouble within a day. <laughs> Three days, we'd be in deep doo-doo. <laughs> yeah, we would. There'd be no Nandos. There'd be just a disaster. <laughs> yeah, seven days, we're now looking at no longer at rescue. We're looking at recovery. Terrible Wi-Fi. <laughs> it would be a nightmare. <laughs> But I tell you, you know, I, I can show you, we can't really easily broadcast on the podcast because it's an object. But when I was in Ethiopia doing survey a few years back, I was walking around. And as, as is my habit, I carried a little Swiss Army knife, this thing. Yeah, right? there we go. You're, you're holding and, one under the it camera. It has my name on it nice. and this kind of stuff. I use it for sundry little, little tasks in the field. And as I was walking around, I, I saw this red rock. With this thing? Yeah, a little, little slither of red rock. Oh my God, it looks just like this. It's a, well, it's a piece of flint, a yeah. reddish piece of flint. And on one side, you've got a, well, a blade that's been chipped away. So it looks a bit like a razor clam or something. I think those two are kind of the equivalent of each other. That little red rock is an unusual sort of rock in this part of Africa. You don't find this very often. And when you do find it, the people who are using it hammered it into splinters. This is the biggest piece of the sort of red jasper I've, I've seen in doing four years of field work down there. So somebody was really angry when they lost this. This is probably their equivalent of their, you know, multi-tool. <laughs> so we started off talking about like a big grapefruit-sized rock, and you've just showed us a, a kind of a sort of early Swiss army knife. Can you just sort of tell us the sort of evolution of stone tools and what they would look like? For about the first million years of stoneworking, maybe a little bit more, maybe one and a half million, the tools that our ancestors were using were essentially roundish or, or, or squarish blocks of stone with little fracture scars on them, where somebody would hit the rock with 
another rock and create a little concavity. A little piece would fall off the, the rock. And, and do, doing this repetitively creates a little jagged edge around one or more parts of the rock. That is essentially the first one and a half million years of stoneworking. Then about 1.8 million years ago, and this is probably not a coincidence, we start seeing hominins with larger brains whose bodies below the neck look like ours. So, you know, a true waist, big shoulders, mm -hmm. narrow hips, long legs, short arms, these things. They start looking like us, and that's when we start seeing things that look different. It's no longer just a matter of hitting a rock and knocking off little flakes. They start planning things. They make these things we call hand axes. Most of them, on average, are about the size of your hand. If you put your hand up, make your thumb parallel your fingers, that's basically the average size of a hand axe. Well, I think about stone tablets as well. You know, cuneiform stone tablets are about the size of an iPhone so as well. These hand axes start showing up. And we also start seeing the tool makers chipping the edges of smaller tools as if they used them, it got dull, they chipped the edge to make it sharp for a little bit or to change the shape to suit a different task. So this tells us something. And the third thing we see is they start moving the rocks around the landscape greater distances. Before 1.8 million years ago, most of the rocks are from geologic sources within a half a day's walk or less from where we find them. Hmm. After 1.8 million years ago, these Homo erectus, we call them, these creatures appear to have been fairly good runners and, and long distance endurance walkers and things like this. They're moving rocks greater distances, which tells us they're carrying the rocks with them. Hmm. And it's probably no coincidence that, that their designs start to approximate modern day artifacts. You know, we specifically designed for ease of use, ease of carrying. After that, there are a few minor changes. They stopped making the hand axes after about a quarter million years ago. All throughout, this, there is not a trend, but there's a tendency to make smaller and smaller artifacts. Well, that's interesting. I mean, I think of things like arrowheads, for example, yeah. which are very small and very sharp. Well, when are we talking about that? There's still a bit of controversy about when people made arrowheads out of stone. The oldest evidence that's generally accepted clocks in around 70,000 years ago from sites in Africa. It's a puzzle. Part of it is that, again, we're just looking at the stone, and the stone's really durable. People in recent African contexts, hunter-gatherers, use other things for arrowheads. Hard bits of wood, bits of bone. So we may be missing things, but pretty much around the world where people used bows and arrows before mm. they got their hands on metal, they used stone. Now, th there's a puzzle. You kind of expect a, a technology mm. like that that's versatile, where you can use the same tool to knock down an elephant as you could do to knock down birds. The first evidence for this technology shows up in Europe and Western Asia at about the same time that people like us, Homo sapiens, show up in Europe and Western Asia. So one of the big puzzles is, why didn't Neanderthals figure this out? It's not that they were dumb. These guys had brains bigger than most of the people who study them. Which, you know? <laughs> which kind of makes me wonder, we've sort of talked about the tools and how we made them, but how did the tools change us? So we're making the tools to fit our needs. In return, did we change because of the tools we made? This is projecting a bit. Um, we often anthropomorphize inanimate objects. We imbue qualities to the objects that are in our imagination. This little red rock I showed you yes. was probably not just a little red rock. In the same way that my Swiss Army knife is not just a bit of plastic and, and metal. You know, it's something my wife bought me ages and ages and ages ago. It has symbolism, it has the meaning. Mm -hmm. So we anthropomorphize them, we imbue them with, with qualities. We treat them as symbols. You know, and, and archaeologists, in their search for answers to these who's, who questions, they look for objects like my knife, something that is distinctive. It's like a badge. It tells you something about the identity. You can see I hold up the Swiss Army knife. There's a little Swiss Army logo on it. I've got my name carved on the other side of it. It's a badge. Exactly. They have meaning. I was looking at your coffee mug, which has a logo on it, your yellow coffee mug. That has meaning. And I can't remember land what of it enchantment. Is. There you go, from New Mexico. Because <laughs> obviously, around about the time we're seeing stone tools, we're also seeing human culture. We're seeing adornment and we're seeing now, these human attributes we find. Remember our survival example. Yeah. I told you, you and your friend have decided to self rescue. Go find the guys who are watching the giraffes and things. Mm -hmm. You left the trail of stone where you were. And you're leaving a trail of stone where you're on your path. Those stones are broadcasting a message, even though you don't know it. Your friends will look and they'll say, oh, Dallas was here with Bob. Or somebody was here. And since we're the only humans around, these are our people. Just making stone tools creates essentially artificial footprints that are indestructible. Mm -hmm. The next windstorm, your footprints are gone. Those stone tools you and your friend left behind, they're still there. They're still there in the sediment someplace. So stone tools could be... Symbolic artifacts from the very first moment these creatures were making them. And nobody thinks about this, partly because they look at this, these stone tools as waste. They think, oh, they're making this, this hand axe and all the rest of this, these little chips and things. That's just production waste. For, for the little chips, they even use a French word, debitage, 
which is French for dry waste, like shavings in a carpenter shop. It doesn't occur to people that these things are like trail markers. And part of it is that they're accustomed to thinking of them as either as waste or as badges. Hmm. You know, I, I look at the stone tools and I say, now, this is something else. These aren't badges. They're not wearing them. They're not waste. Why would they bother concentrating these things around their habitation sites if they're waste? Who lives on a pile of garbage? They're lawn art. You know, when people put decorations on their, on their front lawn, yeah. that broadcasts a message about who's at that place and something about what they believe. So if they put a statue of the Virgin Mary, you can fairly well assume they're Christians. The stone tools could be prehistoric lawn art. Well, that's interesting. So they, as well as tools being useful, yes. you're saying that perhaps they have a, a, a symbolic, an artistic, a, some kind of cultural reference. Let me give you an example. If I taught you how to make stone tools tomorrow, the kind of stone tools you'd make would differ from those I've made. I've been making stone tools, I've, got, I've lost track now, like 40 years or something like this. Your stone tools would say something about you. My stone tools would say something about me. And somebody coming back to that place where we, I taught you how to make stone tools could say, okay, here's an expert and a learner. They get some information about who is there. The stone tools I would make would probably differ from the kinds of stone tools that one of my French colleagues would make or one of my English colleagues or one of my Kenyan colleagues. It would choose different kinds of rocks, would make different sorts of tools. If you had the right eye for it and the right knowledge, you could read this lithic litter as evidence for who is present. That's interesting. Let's say you went back 100,000 years rather than 3 million. You go back 100,000 years and you're thinking, well, there's stone tools here. Other people must have camped here. Oh, well, these look like the stone tools that archaeologists say humans made. There are other humans. Let's camp here. If they show up, they'll probably be friendly. Or you go to another site and you look around. This is a great place. It's a cave. There's water nearby. There's bees with honey combs up in the trees there. There's a fig tree with fruit. This is great. And you look around the ground and there's no stone tools. This might not be such a good camping place because there's no evidence people camped here like stone tools. The absence of these stone tools might broadcast an important natural selection information. Like, don't camp here. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think there was a reverence towards the tools, though? A bit like your Swiss Army life. Do you think somebody would have made an arrowhead and, oh, this is a particularly good one. I love this one. and I'm going to pass it down to my children or whatever, you know, in the way that we venerate objects. Recent people who make stone tools sometimes do that. So it's <laughs> possible. I would. If I made a beautiful, I'd be like, I'm keeping that. Oh, yeah. I've got stone tools yeah. in a drawer here that I made when I was 11. You know, I've kept them. I brought them from my parents' home in Massachusetts all the way here to New York. And I'll probably take them down into Mexico when I retire. We do every so often find cases where people from one time period have somewhere found or dug up or just picked up stone tools made thousands of years earlier. In some cases, they would drag these rocks back to their cave and hammer them into whatever was the appropriate way of making stone tools. Other times, they just leave these things alone. Actually, we found this at the site of the oldest human fossils in Ethiopia, at Omo Kibish. We're digging and we're finding these little tiny little rocks that are the sort of things people were making 200,000 years ago. And there, right next to where the fossil occurs, is this great big hand axe of the sort that people made a quarter million years earlier. Now, it could just be this thing was rolling around in the sediments and that the Omo One, our, our fossil, died and this thing just happened to be nearby. Or it could be these guys are founding, finding older tools and thinking them curious. We don't make this. What the hell is this thing? <laughs> do you think that stone tools, particularly, do you think that they left a legacy in how we interact with technology in the world today. I mean, we've been, we've been sort of holding up Swiss Army knives and, and iPhones and, and, and what have you. What is that legacy, do you think? First off, it's a, a durable legacy that shows we change our world to suit our needs. If there aren't sharp rocks around, we make sharp rocks. There are precursors to this or parallels to this among other animals. So birds make nests, chimpanzees make termite fishing sticks and this sort of thing. The difference between us and them is that our things are durable and they're investments. The stone tools that you and your friend left in Eastern Africa and the tools that the early hominids made the next day, they're available to all of your descendants. If you went to that site in the present day and you needed a sharp rock, the sharp rocks are still there. Thank you, ancestral stone workers. So we invest in technology for the long haul. Other creatures' technologies are passing. They come, they go. They got, they got like a candle. Whereas ours is like, you know, a, a nuclear reaction. Yeah, I'm just imagining the Steve Jobs of the stone tool world. Yeah, just, <laughs> this guy sitting around making stone tools and all the mothers and the other, other people. And the, you stop banging those rocks together. <laughs> We're trying to sleep. Go get some food. We're hungry. <laughs> Before I let you go, John, I just want to, reading your paper on, on survival archaeology, which I'm encouraging everyone to read, at the end of that paper, you make a case about why understanding this is important as a species going forward. And I'm wondering if you could elucidate a little bit of that for us here. Well, I'll tell you. 
People think the ice ages are over. They aren't. The ice will come back. It's driven by variation in Earth's orbit. Unless we do something really stupid and mess up the Earth's orbit, the ice will come back. And in the far future, we may need stone tools again. Right now, only a very small number of people know how to make stone tools. As an investment in our species' future, we ought to be teaching more people how to make and use stone tools. You know, after the ice comes back, not just once, but two, three, four times, we're not going to be making tools out of bronze. Mm. There's only so much petroleum, so only so much a limited supply of plastic. You can only recycle so much. But stone tools are a renewable resource. As you and I are talking, somewhere in the world, a volcano is erupting and ejecting all kinds of, of volcanic glass into the Earth's surface. They'll be available for our great, 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 great to the nth power descendants to turn into razor sharp artifacts and to shape the world as they see fit. There's a nice little quote at the end of this paper I keep talking about from Henry V, I think. All things are ready if our minds be so. My favorite Shakespeare quote. Why did you put that quotation in? What do you mean by that? What's your What's your point? The point is, people say, well, I want a survival kit. I want a survival knife. I want a survival this kind of thing. I say, look, I teach this stuff at college. And I said, look, guys, you already have your most important survival tool, your brain. <laughs> your mind. That's your survival tool. There we go. That's a good, a good place to pause, I think. <laughs> hey, listen, if people want to find out more from you, where would you point them if they want to read a bit more of your work but, or see some of your stuff? Where, should, where can we point them to? Um, I have a Google site that lists my recent publications. There's sub pages for the uh, Unstoppable Species book, reprints. Just type my name, archaeologist, and, and you'll get to me. I, almost all of my things are online. Thanks very much for coming on the show. It's been a pleasure. It's been a You're most welcome, pleasure. Dallas. You have a good day. That's it. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much for your company, as ever. It's appreciated. I hope you've enjoyed this one. I hope you've enjoyed other ones. I hope you will continue to support us by telling your friends and family about our podcast series. And don't forget, if you've got a suggestion or a story or a somebody we want to meet that you think would be a good guest on the show then don't forget to get in touch you can email us as ever at patented at historyhit.com or just stop me on social media or stop me on the street as ever and and let me know i look forward to your company next time bye